The primary police responsibility during a disaster or emergency situation is the protection of life. This is the story of how the RCMP helped protect the lives of the people of Fort McMurray during the fire and the evacuation of 2016. It began as just another nearby forest fire on a Sunday in May. As residents of a forest-surrounded community, RCMP members are cognizant of the fire threat. They actually have strategies to deal with such threats, including the worst-case fire scenario that was about to unfold. Approximately a month prior to the fires, we actually did our business continuity planning for, for, for a disaster if we lost one of our buildings to fire. And uh, so our planning was sort of in place. We never thought we'd lose two buildings, basically. They're both standing, but the operation of them. That just another fire was soon to become the beast that would turn Fort McMurray into a ghost town. So I came in for my shift and there's some talk that the fires were close. The previous day we had been assigned to watch, make sure that nobody went into a, went into a neighborhood that was just, just south of town. In a day, that fire more than doubled in size. Then it doubled again in just three hours. It was late afternoon where the fire grew rapidly and dramatically and, and caught, I think, a lot of people living in this community by surprise. Flames were really lapping at the side of Highway 63. In some cases, they, they jumped the highway, making that major thoroughfare impassable at some points. It feasted on the dry forest, the hot weather, the high winds, and the low humidity. No fire breaks. Not even the mighty Athabasca River would stop that fire. So on Sunday night, recognizing the threats the wildfires were posing, we opened this room and we staffed it 24-7. In the event that we had to evacuate people in the middle of the night, uh, we'd have those extra resources on hand. Because to call members in the middle of the night and say, hey, we need you really quick, there's still a lag time, which could have put the public in jeopardy. Every one of that city's 136 RCMP members could see the fire and hear it. It sounded like a giant storm rushing towards them, or worse, sneaking up behind them. At times, they'd be so close to the flames, they'd wonder if it might melt their tires or even their windshield. And the smoke, the smoke was inescapable. Yet it'd block out the sun, turn day into night, make their eyes water and be so choking, it'd drive them back into their patrol cars for a breath of its air-conditioned air. So you know those like dust storms and stuff you see like in the Middle East on TV and stuff? We had one of those in Beacon Hill. I couldn't see two feet in front of me. Ash, dust, wind, smoke, whatever other things that fire created. It was like one giant dust storm. Like I said, within half an hour that entire area was on fire. And so was Abyssin. It was a powerful reminder for all first responders that they're responsible for the safety of 88,000 men, women, and children. So RCMP members did what they've been trained to do. They put their boots on the ground. They left the fire to the firefighters and focused on guiding people to safety. So I had to basically drive in the oncoming lane to just to get to the intersection because it was uncontrolled. Basically, my instructions were to stop all lanes of traffic except for those coming out of Beacon Hill. Um, that obviously was a challenge, me being the only person there for probably the first 15 minutes or so. Directing two lanes north, two lanes south, two turn lanes onto Gregoire Drive, plus all the Gregoire traffic and anybody wanting to come into Beacon Hill was a challenge. Together with some municipal peace officers and a small contingent of sheriffs, they numbered just over 200 they direct traffic, answer questions, respond to calls, encourage evacuation, and urge people to prepare for the worst. Most people were fairly calm when you spoke to them. And if you looked in their eyes, they weren't, because they knew how bad it was getting. Um, and we're standing there and we waved to we tried to wave to them, you know, we're flagging traffic go this way and people come up and they give us a wave and you wave back and they just, they just kept on going and they just kept coming. It was amazing, they just, like, cars just never stopped. 
they would struggle to keep up with totally unpredictable, fast-changing conditions while they stuffed their patrol cars full of people needing a ride to evacuation centers. They rescued a woman from her home who was confined to a wheelchair, and thank goodness they did. Her house would later burn to the ground. And above all, RCMP members would empathize with their fellow citizens because if ever there was a time for a community and its police forces to have each other's backs, this was it. I'm a single body in the middle of two and a half lanes and anybody could have blown by me if they wanted to. I'm not gonna stand in the way of 3,000 pounds. And it didn't matter. Everybody just put everything on hold and for that period of time, they just listened to us without question. We said, you need to do this. You need to turn your car this way and you need to go that way. And you need to forget what's behind you. And everybody just said, okay. When the first few neighborhoods were evacuated, residents were frantic. Couples had lost track of each other. Their kids were in schools, unreachable because of traffic jams, roadblocks, and fire. It was confusing and it was frightening. It was a nightmare. In such chaos, people need stability, some hope and reassurance, and everyone needs someone they can count on, someone they can trust in. I, th I think they were, <laughs> I think they were looking at, looking to us f for reassurance that no matter what, it was going to be okay. Um, because of, we started to panic, and they saw that we started to panic then there was no way that they could reason we could reasonably expect them to follow our directions and there's no way that they could have any confidence in what we did ask or tell them to do our job is public safety it is to protect and preserve life first and foremost and on that day everybody said we're doing it we're we're doing whatever you need whatever you say we're doing it our cmp members had each other to trust they reassured each other and they knew what was needed. So they projected an aura of calm dependability. Whether they felt that way or not, they were what they are obliged to be, professional. And Fort McMurray's residents would take heart in that. Uh, most of our members were in those pockets that were burning to get those people out. And as they were standing there, we, we could hear all the radio chatter. We had radios up here to monitor what was going on. And you could hear the uh, intensity in the members' voices, like, the fire's here, we gotta go. We don't have time to check every door. They were driving through neighborhoods on their speakers, their car speakers, and jumping fences, doing door-to-door -door knocks as fast as they could. But the fire just, it didn't give us enough time. And we had members that were literally within meters of the fire and had to say, we gotta go. It would destroy 2,400 homes and buildings, consume an area the size of Prince Edward Island. It would create its very own climate. If timber lead attachment goes down and we can't work here, where do we go? So we go to the South Policing Facility. But we didn't plan on, if that goes down as well, where do you go? And so then we were like a traveling roadshow with our emergency operations center, you know, moving around. And the fires dictated where we went. Members were jumping in vehicles with other members. They were doing whatever they had to do to get it done. If the road clears, which it did a few hours later, then you have to make patrols to Timberley and that to make sure you know that if there are any stragglers behind, get them out and to make sure that there's no looting or any other issues like that. As individuals, as an organization and as a community, we don't always know what we're capable of until we're faced with those monumental challenges. From our Division Emergency Operations Centre, who were responsible for coordinating all the logistics in terms of scheduling, lodging, and food, to our 911 operators who were managing all the distress calls, to our non-uniform employees working behind the scenes. I can say without question, our main goal was always public safety. Doing their duty was going way above and beyond what many RCMP members had ever experienced before. Most worked 72 hours straight some even longer. All RCMP members put in hours that would normally be deemed ridiculous, but they weren't during that week in May in Fort McMurray. 
Such hours were the norm, day after day. A few officers kind of amongst the highway uh, and myself were basically decided if they're north of this point and if they're south of this point, you split them both directions. So we started diverting traffic up north. At the end of the day, that pressure was relieved off south traffic and in a couple hours, you could actually start to see the back of the pack. Just about everyone was in line. And though those lines were slow moving, people trusted in the RCMP members and officers guiding the evacuation. RCMP members stepped in and provided convoy duty, shepherding 50 vehicles at a time. They led several thousand families through smoke and at times, a phalanx of fire along the side of the road. RCMP members, checking for stragglers, watched the destruction while wondering how their own homes in neighborhoods across the city were faring. No one knew till later, but 15 RCMP would lose their homes to the fire. And the remains. They looked like the aftermath of an atomic bomb or the apocalyptic set of a Hollywood movie. On seeing it for the first time in person, visitors are often stunned into silence. If that's their experience, what's it like for the family that used to love living here? It's emergency preparedness, and it's the thread that sews together the fabric of every uniformed force. So impressed and appreciative were the residents of the city, they have since vetted and paid tribute to the RCMP and the other first responders in a number of ways, maybe best visually summed up by the murals on this motor coach. It was unveiled at yet another barbecue that said, thank you for taking such good care of all of us, your friends and your neighbors in Fort McMurray. Well, they say adversity brings out the best in us. And at that particular moment in time, when those fires broke out, I feel it did bring out the best in all of us. From the moment our Fort McMurray members responded with boots on the ground, to the moment that every single employee from across Alberta and Canada returned home safely. Every single one of them displayed leadership, perseverance, dedication, and professionalism. Hey, everybody heard the news reports. You know, everybody called it the beast because it was so out of control, because it was so unpredictable. And you, you look at the aftermath of it, and it just seemed fickle. It would pick off two dozen houses and then it would leave three and they'd be untouched and then on the other side of it there'd be another two dozen houses gone. But it almost seemed taunting. And anything that's that dangerous to begin with that seems to be able to have a mind of its own to think, to just flaunt its power almost, like, I'm going to do this and there's nothing you can do about it. We should have been terrified. We should have been absolutely terrified. But we had a job to do. Those neighborhoods uh, were evacuated, obviously, with complete success. We didn't, uh, we didn't lose anybody, which still, to this day, it brings tears to my eyes, the, uh, the effort made by those frontline members. It's absolutely heroic, incredible, amazing, and they have my complete respect.